All right, so we have made it up to Unit 7 of God's Economics. Unit 7 is God's Way, Total Dependence and Outpoured Generosity. Hallelujah. And friends, I hope sincerely that through this course, particularly the parables, but just through all the different pictures of of God and money, the way that we've looked at it, I sincerely hope that God is starting to reframe uh, the way that you think about money, the way that you think about how God does things. But this unit is talking about, okay, we're not doing it Babylon's way. We had a whole unit on that. But if Babylon's way is wrong, then we can't just say, oh, well, don't do it Babylon's way. Okay, but what is the right way? And the parables, unit six, the parables of Jesus about money, gave us a good setup of understanding the heart of God and the driving passion of God and what he wants our money going towards. Even Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So is your heart in a bank right now? Is your heart in a mutual fund right now? Is your heart only with your family and your own biological children? Or is your heart actually with God and the purposes of God and the kingdom of God and the things that are important to God? Where your treasure is, your heart is. So let's take a look at God's way. And the opening scripture for this unit. And this is, um, if you have just come out of unit six and where we left off with the rich young ruler and understanding that the context for the rich young ruler coming up to Jesus, he had just finished saying that we all have to become like little children. God's way is to be the father God's way is to be the one who created the whole world and deserves for us to humble ourselves before him. And part of acknowledging who he is and his great power over everything is considering him to be trustworthy, that instead of hoarding everything all for ourselves and keeping control of everything with a tight grip, that we will let go and let God, that we will trust God with our lives, that we will trust God with everything about us, including our resources. So the opening scripture is from Luke 18, 17. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So we've got to become like little children in order to do things God's way. So God's way, this is point A, is giving in faith. So we heard a lot through the parables about outpoured generosity. But in order to be generous, so there are a couple elements of that. We talked about the value. What is the worth of a sheep that is lost? What is the worth, the value of a coin that is lost? What is the value of a son or a daughter who has gone prodigal? What would you give to have those back in your arms again, right? So there's the value, there's the worth there. But when you're giving in faith, giving in faith without knowing that you're going to get something in return, giving in faith, you have to believe that God is trustworthy, So yes, it's like maybe you want to spend all that you have to bring people into the kingdom of God because you've tapped in to understand the priority of God and his kingdom and his purposes. But yet there's this, wait a second, but if I give everything I have so that they can come into the kingdom, well, then I'm going to have nothing. So that's a problem. So I can only give just this much for, for them, for their soul, even though, yes, I see the worth, I see the worth, I see the value, I understand. But here's the problem. If I give everything I have so that they can be saved, then I'm not going to have anything. Well, that's where faith is required. To give everything you own away, to give just the littlest bit of what you own away, to give anything for the purpose of God. First, you have to believe that God exists. Second, you have to believe that you're participating in something that God considers to be valuable, right? Not by your own estimation of what is valuable, but what God says 
is valuable and worthy. And then when you give it and it releases out of your control and out of your hand and out of your wallet, that you give in faith, trusting that God will be faithful, that God will not fail you, that God will provide for you. You have to have no fear of lack. What's the opposite of faith? Fear. If you have fear of lack, you have fear of not having enough, it's because you are full of unbelief. So I'm not condemning you. There are teachers out there. They're just, well, you have no faith. You have no faith. You got to, you have no, and you know, sometimes Jesus did talk like that. Hey, the disciples came to him and said, why can we cast that demon out? And Jesus said, well, it's because of your little faith. It's because of your unbelief, right? So giving as an act of faith, you have to have no fear, no fear that God will not prove to be exactly who he says he is. No fear of lack. Or this is my expression. I learned to say this as God has led me through giving everything I own away and living entirely by God's uh, provision in total and complete dependence upon him, not asking anyone for anything that I need, but trusting him in prayer and obeying his voice. But the expression that I came up with, you know, as I was going through this, and I still say it even to this day, is I have have no fear of zero. I have no fear of zero. If my bank account gets down to zero, I am not afraid of zero because God can turn a zero into a couple of zeros with another number at the front, which means I actually have money in my account. God can do anything. God is faithful. God has never failed me. I am not afraid of zero. But in order for you to give anything, even if it's a small thing, You have to have no fear that God will fail you. He will not fail you. Actually, the opposite turns out to be true. What Proverbs chapter 3 says, verse 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Hallelujah. When you are honoring the Lord, with what you have, meaning your money and your possessions, God will surely bless you with more than you can contain. And this is the thing. You know, people look at my life. I live very modestly. And people say, well, you're still poor. You're still in lack. No, you don't understand. I am connected to the one who owns the whole world. All, every single resource in heaven and earth is available to me. All I have to do is walk in the purpose of God. I'm not looking for earthly wealth to justify myself in the sight of people or even in my own sight. My purpose is to do the will of the Father. And as long as I'm doing God's will, I will never lack. God will cause everything in this universe to align with what I am doing if I am in the will of God. So my my function, my purpose is prayer. My purpose is I've got to keep connected to God. I've got to keep myself on my face in prayer, humbled like a little child before the Father. Because there are times when God has asked me to do things that cost a lot of money. And you know what? He has provided for all of it. Traveling around the world is not cheap. And God sends me to places where there is extreme poverty, feeding people, going to places, paying for all of that. It's expensive. But God is faithful. If it is his will, he makes a way. He has all kinds of ways of doing that. So yes, to you, I might still look poor. But I'm connected to the one who owns it all, and he will never fail me as long as I keep walking in his will and doing the things that are pleasing to him. Hallelujah. And it's not even because of my own obedience. It's because of Jesus that I am washed clean and that God provides for me. He has never let me go without a roof over my head, without food in my belly. He has been absolutely and totally faithful. 
We also want to give, uh, this is a side note, give in obedience to the direction of the Holy Spirit. So that means we have to live a life always listening, attentively listening to the whisper of the Holy Spirit. That means you've got to practice hearing God's voice. If you're going to practice hearing God's voice, you also need to practice doing what he says when he says it. Jesus even said, and this was about listening, he said, be careful how you hear, how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And to the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Jesus said that about hearing. So if you're hearing the voice of God, but you're not doing anything with it, then he's going to stop talking. But if you hear the voice of God and you do something with it, you obey what the Spirit of the Lord says to you, then he will keep talking. He'll tell you all kinds of things. But we've got to stay attentive. So we have to listen, be attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and always be willing. Here's the secret. The Spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. The Holy Spirit is always willing to do the will of God. You know, the Holy Spirit says, give a thousand dollar offering over here. The, the, The Lord says that to you. The Holy Spirit is like, yes, but your flesh is like, what? No way. I don't want to give that. You know, the, the the Spirit of the Lord says, you know, go spend three hours in prayer, and the Holy Spirit inside of you is like, yes, but your flesh is like, uh, I'd rather, uh, can I just go watch TV? You know, so the Spirit is always willing. You have to keep yourself willing. Recognize that God is king and you are are not. Be willing to give whatever God tells you, whenever he tells you, to whomever he tells you to give it to. None of your own preconceived notions, none of your own prejudices or biases. You don't get to be a racist and obey God. You don't get to be, you know, partiality to the rich and hating the poor and and obey God. No, whoever God tells you to give to, whatever you think of them doesn't matter. You're dead in Christ. Be alive to the Spirit and obey what the Spirit tells you to do. Be willing to give whatever God tells you whenever he tells you. Through this, by obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit and giving to what the Holy Spirit tells you to give to, whether it's the poor, whether it's a ministry that has access to different poor people that you wouldn't necessarily have access to, through this, this is how we lay up treasures in heaven by giving to the things that are important to God, by giving to the kingdom of God. Lay up treasures for in heaven for eternity, not on earth, not in your bank account. We've talked about this several times about what laying up treasures is. But here's the deal. If you give and then you receive, whether that's money you give or service you give, if you receive any kind of pay, remuneration, recognition, reward in this world, uh, you have been paid. You know, in this in this earth, on this earth, if you've been paid for your service or you've been recognized for your giving publicly, and this is something that was arranged and you knew that you would be recognized for it or you are recognizing yourself. Now, I'm not saying if you give a gift and you give it um, secretly and you give it to honor God and then someone else mentions that you gave, that doesn't mean that you've been paid in full. You know, they, they are the one who made the choice. You would have gone on in secrecy. The Lord knows your heart. It's about the heart. But if you are receiving pay or remuneration or recognition for giving, for what you give and how you serve and how you're pouring your life out, then you have been paid in full. And Jesus made that clear. Don't give like the Pharisees. They give to be seen by men. Now, where you have to be careful with this is pastors, Pastors out there or anyone who's employed by a church or employed by a ministry. Now, it's wonderful that you're working for God and working for the kingdom of God, but you are being paid a salary. You are a laborer. You received a salary. So much of the work that you are doing for that church or ministry, you have already been paid in full. 
So you might be surprised, depending on where your heart is at and what you're doing on your own time, you might be surprised when you stand before Jesus and the reward that you receive from him is not as large as what you're expecting. Well, it's because you're already being paid your wages here on earth. Now, yes, I understand pastors, the the pastor, he the one who preaches the gospel can make his living by the gospel. We're going to talk about that in unit eight. We will cover that, right? The laborer, the worker is worthy of his wages. I understand. But Jesus said that to his disciples, to the apostles when he sent them out, as far as eat what they serve you, not receive their pay, not be paid for the proclamation of the kingdom of God. But when you go, don't bring any money, be a child, be like a child, go out there by faith, proclaim the kingdom of God, stay in a house, receive the gift of their hospitality, that's part of your pay, receive the gift of their food, that's part of your pay, the laborer deserves his wages, but not a paycheck. If you are receiving a paycheck, you have been paid in full on the earth. But you will receive a heavenly reward for anything on this on this earth that you have done or given for the kingdom of God for which you have not received remuneration here on earth. Okay, this is how the dynamics work. You get paid on earth, you don't get paid in heaven. You get paid in heaven for what you didn't receive any pay or recognition for here on earth. Do you get it? This is how we lay up treasures in heaven to receive a heavenly reward. The other element of that, and this will start to seem like a recap, but I'm trying to pull all the pieces together as we get into these final units, is it's kingdom living now, which means faithfulness to God and to God's ways now. So what we just learned in the parables of Jesus, Jesus said, if you're faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with a lot. If you're not faithful with a little, with earthly money, with unrighteous mammon, with unrighteous wealth, then how can you be trusted with eternal resources, right? Heaven and the world to come is going to be run God's way. God's way. So if you're not living by God's ways now, if you're living by Babylon's ways now, then, uh, hello, you haven't learned how to do things God's way. So how do you possibly think that God is going to entrust you to run a city his way when you have not proven that you know anything about his ways whatsoever? In order for us to lay up those treasures in heaven and receive that eternal responsibility, we have to start living now in the ways of the kingdom of God. And that means faithfulness to God. In heaven, God's will is always done perfectly. Jesus said, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, everything, everything obeys God perfectly. Are you? Are you obeying God perfectly? In heaven, everything is run according to God's exact design and exact command. Are are you living that way? Everything in heaven is aligned with the will and the ways of God. Are, Are you living that way? So you have to start living the way of the kingdom now. And that will require, this is point four, we already talked about this in this unit, we have to give with childlike faith. And even if that makes us totally dependent on God. This is from Luke 18. I know we read this earlier, but it just, we need to hear it again. Jesus called them to him. These are the children. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So here we go. In your giving, are you willing to put yourself out there in total dependence like a child Because you trust that God will be faithful, because you trust that he will not fail you, because you are so aligned with heaven's priorities, with the priorities of the kingdom of God, that you're willing to go without, knowing that God will never fail to provide for you, 
and just have total childlike faith in him. All right, so here's the deal. What you do shows what you really believe. What you do, not what you say. See, there are all these teachings out there in the body of Christ today, especially in the West, but the West has permeated a lot of the other church cultures of, you know, it's all these proclamations with your mouth and, you know, I proclaim this and I prophesy that and I rebuke that, I reject that in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And it's just nothing but the power of positive thinking with Jesus' name tacked onto it. I don't see any example in the scripture of that being how we are supposed to conduct ourselves. What you do shows me what you really believe. Not all this other nonsense and all these other proclamations. You can proclaim yourself silly, but what you do is going to show me who you really are and what you really believe and what you really are all about. Okay? What you do is the demonstration of what you believe, not not what you say. So let's look. There are a couple of scriptures that really pack a punch on this. James chapter 2, starting with verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, And one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So, you know, if you've been tracking along with this course, you know, we talked about the rich man and Lazarus. So if you're the rich man and there's a poor man who's a believer, a fellow believer, standing there in need of food and clothing and shelter, and you just say, oh, God loves you, bless you, I'll be praying for you, but you never help to supply them with food, even though you have so much food on your table that you're throwing it in the trash, or you're giving filet mignon to your dog, even though there are people out there who need to eat a meal. If you're saying that you have faith, but you're like the rich man who went to Hades, not giving to the poor man what was needed for his comfort, his consolation, just his daily provision, then what James is saying is you don't have faith at all. I'll show you my faith by my works. See, I'll pour my life out. I'll give everything I have. I'll constantly keep giving, giving, giving all the time. Even though I'm already poor, I'll give, I give sometimes to people who have more than I do because you know what? I have more faith than they do. And I'm so connected to God and he owns the whole world. So it doesn't matter. They need to see the mercy of God. But you know, that, that takes faith. That, that's what we're talking about. It takes faith. It takes faith to give even when you don't have enough. To give even if it will mean that you go without But that's what faith is. Jesus gave it all. And if you say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a strong Christian. Really? Show me. John said it this way. By this, we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Brothers in this context means other believers who are in the new covenant you know, with Jesus, whose sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus, who profess Jesus as Lord, who believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. That is the fellowship of believers that John is talking about in this particular sentence. But we also know that Jesus laid down his life for the whole 
world. So yes, there is some partiality to making sure that there are no poor among us as the brothers and sisters in Christ, because that's the demonstration to the world of the love of God, that there are no poor among us. That's the witness that God wants for us to the world of how what wonderful and amazing good care we take of one another and how much we love one another. But there should be not only no lack among us as the brothers, but so much abundance because we're the ones in the world connected to God that we can share that blessing with the rest of the world. This has been God's purpose for redeeming the world since he called Abraham. Okay, God's plan purpose doesn't change, just the characters change along the way as God takes us closer and closer to the redemption of the whole world and the age to come. Okay, so John is saying, by this, by this, we know love. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, here we go. Are you the rich man and Lazarus? Has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So there's the expression, talk is cheap, and mouths never stop. Mouths never stop talking, but deeds are costly. The truth, the reality of laying down your life, the reality of giving up something that you have so that somebody else can prosper, putting yourself in lack so that somebody else can prosper or come to know God, that's costly. Showing mercy to those who don't deserve it, that's costly. Dying to yourself, dying to your own desires, giving up your own luxuries and comfort, that's costly. So show me what you got. Don't talk. I don't want to hear any more talk. What you do shows me who you really are and what you really believe. So here, just to wrap this up, are some common self-deceptions. Self-deception on this issue, number one, I have faith. Now, I have faith is spoken oftentimes by people whose life, priorities, actions, and choices are totally conformed to the pattern of this world, which we've called the pattern of Babylon, rather than being conformed to the commands of Jesus. So what we just learned from James and John is that those people don't have faith at all. But they're saying all the time, I have faith. I'm a believer. I have faith. I'm a strong Christian. Really? Okay, no, you're self-deceived. You might have said a prayer that Jesus is Lord, but everything else about the way you conduct yourself shows me that you don't have faith at all. The way that we show our faith is by doing what Jesus says and by living our lives the way that Jesus did. Self-deception number two, I am generous. People like to think that they are so generous. I am generous. But this is oftentimes spoken by people who are not even tithing. They don't even give God 10%. Okay? So you're not even not generous. You're a robber. You're a thief. You're a robber. You rob God. So, but you, you're saying, oh, I'm generous. I like to give generously. Really? You're a thief. Okay. Spoken by people who are not even tithing, who do not give to the poor, people who use, I hate these things. It, like if we ever eat at a restaurant together, do not get out a tip chart. If you cannot hear the Holy Spirit for how much of a tip you're supposed to leave your waiter or your waitress, and first of all, you should be giving a gigantic tip to them anyway, because that's their livelihood and they just served you. Okay, I don't care even if they did a lousy job. Give them a big tip. Maybe they did a lousy job because the last person they served used a tip chart and was super cheap. Okay, don't be stingy. Put the tip chart away. Give them a gigantic tip. Okay, people who calculate their generosity, you know, oh, well, maybe I can't afford to give this much, but I can afford to give that much. No, that's not, we're not supposed to be calculating. No, 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 no. You're supposed to be obeying the Holy Spirit. 
If you're calculating, you're already in a scheme of your own mind. Like I said before, the Holy Spirit, here's the number that God wants you to give. And the Holy Spirit's like, yes, woohoo, we get to give. This is awesome. I'm so excited. But your flesh is like, wait, let me get the Excel spreadsheet. I need a calculator. I'm not sure that I'm comfortable having my balance fall below that amount. All right. So again, I'm talking about self-deception number two. These are people who think that they are generous, but yet their behavior shows me otherwise. Another way that they think that they are generous, but their behavior shows me otherwise is they expect repayment of some sort. For everything that they do. Now, it's not always that they expect to receive something back. Like they might give a generous offering and they don't expect to receive, you know, goods or services or anything like that, but they do expect to receive a special favor. They expect to sit in the front row. They expect you to be all, I'm so, I love you so much. Thank you so much. Now, yes, it's good to be appreciative. If someone is generous to you, it's good to be appreciative. But to demand or expect repayment or recognition is not the evidence of a truly generous heart. So if you are giving, And in your heart, you are still expecting or hoping for some kind of quid pro quo or some kind of repayment somehow or some kind of, oh, yeah, this is going to come back to me. Nope, that is not generosity. Generosity is Jesus laying down his life, expecting nothing in return, expecting nothing in return. Self-deception number three. This is my plan. I'm going to work hard to make a lot of money so I can use it to support kingdom causes. I hear that a lot in the West. And you know what? It sounds great. It's, oh, yeah, you're, look at what a good guy you are. Yeah, you're going to make a lot of money, and then you're going to turn around and give it all away. Yeah, I see. I see the awesome person that you want to be. The problem is you're not that awesome person yet. See, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And the problem is that many, I've met many people who have this idea and very, very few, very few actually succeed in making this a reality. Why? Because this is actually a self-deception that is cleverly disguised by the evil one as a justification for selfish ambition. Sorry, if this is you, I hope I'm exposing the lies you've been telling yourself and the secret justifications of your heart. It's usually a self-deceiving justification for selfish ambition. Most people that I have seen who convince themselves, I'm going to make a lot of money and then give it away, along the way, as they go, they are instead enticed by the ways of this world, the pleasures of this world, and obtaining the luxuries of this world for themselves along the way. And they usually legitimize it in the form of, well, if I'm going to play with the big players, then I've got to have what the big players have. I got to live where the big players live. And I got to, you know, got to spend money to make money. And I got to look the part and do the thing and whatever. And it's like all these justifications come along. And it's because you've convinced yourself that you're making money so you can give it away for the kingdom of God. But, you know, I would refer you back, see the parables of Jesus, soil number three. The deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world choke you from ever growing to spiritual maturity. So we've got to do things God's way. Become like a child. Obey the Holy Spirit. Give to whomever, whenever the Holy Spirit prompts you. And if any of these self-deceptions have called you out of the secrets of your heart, then all I ask is simply repent and start doing things God's way.